Good evening and welcome. This evening, our worship service continues our series through the book of James, and there is an advantage to being a minister, which is you spend basically an entire week with that section of scripture that you're looking at. And so you pray about it, you translate the text, and then you start, you know, basically working through it. And the thing that you always remember is you're preaching to yourself first you. So you never write anything that isn't applied right back at you. And then sometimes because you're the deliverer of such message, you're like, oh, oh. you know, you can just see your fault, faults and flaws and you want to run away from it. You quite frankly don't want to talk about it. You want to go somewhere else and talk about something else. That can't be done. That is not the Lord's will. And so this evening we continue to move through the book of James and as we close out four James lays in front of us two most prominent areas that it is very, very hard for a Christian to humble themselves. And these two areas that are very hard for anyone, but impossible without Christ, is in, an, is in the area of looking at uh, other people, but especially other Christians, and not coming at them in a judgmental attitude or tone. So James takes that on quite heavily in the text this evening. The other area is the foolish mistake of planning a future but leaving God outside of it. And to what great destruction this is to all of us. So James encourages us in humbling ourselves to speak with love for one another in a way that edifies. And at the same time, when considering the future, de volente, the Latin word, Always, de volente, Lord willing. Everything happens by the will of God. We pray that we act in accord with his will. With that in mind, let us pray. Oh Lord God, as we enter your presence for worship, please send your Holy Spirit to guide, direct, and fill us with a sense of humble awe. As we consider all that you have done for us through the atoning work of Jesus Christ. Grant that his resurrection from the dead might serve to strengthen us in life and comfort us when we face death. Accept our prayers and praises as they flow from faith to stay. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's open up our worship by singing hymn 537 every morning. Mercy.
by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. John 13, verse 35, your fellow redeemed. We live in a culture that defines freedom oftentimes in a way that is incredibly opposite how the Bible defines freedom. And I, I wouldn't even go this far to say that the way our culture defines freedom is what the Bible calls sin. Complete autonomy. It's not true freedom. So what does true freedom look like, you might ask, if it's not complete autonomy? Well, the Lord shows you. The Lord lays that out for you beautifully in his word. Look at Jesus Christ. You'll never see a freer, more complete person, period. The book of James lays in front of us what happens when the grace of God is received in our life and we experience true freedom, freedom from our sinful selves, freedom from being in slavery to sin, freedom from what is bad, freedom from the foolishness of thinking that an independence from God is somehow good, somehow desirable. James shows us instead what dependency on God looks like as he works mightily in the lives of his followers. And now by God's grace, we will enter a conversation that we have been in for two weeks where James is stressing the reality of humbling ourselves, knowing that as you humble yourself, it is the Lord who will exalt you. James chapter 4, like I said, draws attention to an area that the Christians he was writing to were totally struggling with. Otherwise, this wouldn't be talked about. An area that I think we would admit we all struggle with. And that is humbling ourselves. We struggle with humbling ourselves and the way that we talk about other people. That, that, that can be very difficult, especially when it comes to judging someone else. We have to talk about that. James does. We also struggle at times and therefore sin against God when we plan a future and leave God out of it. Or we plan and we pray and then we say, God, make it happen because I want it to happen this way. These points aren't new, by the way. It's not as if this conversation just appears in the book of James and nowhere else. If it did, it would still be valid and certain. But this, this is biblical 101. Maybe 103. I don't know. Somewhere in there. Didn't Jesus say on the Sermon on the Mount, judge not, lest ye be judged? But at the same time, didn't Jesus say, the world will look at you and observe you and they should see me. My love should be seen in you. Jesus gives a free pass to the world to look at all of us. And if we are not acting in his love, especially towards each other, but anyone else, we failed. Jesus also, and this will be the parable we read tonight, Jesus also talks about the foolish rich man. He wasn't a fool because he had money. He wasn't a fool because he planned for the future and executed said plan. He was a fool because he did all without the Lord. And so, as you know, his soul was required of him. So Jesus always draws your attention to two days. Today, right now. Today is a gift that God gives you. Today is the acceptable day to find salvation. Today is the day in which the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Focus on Today, But Jesus also would say, focus on judgment day. For the Lord will come like a thief in the night. And then there's the judgment. Those two days, we are to concern ourselves. So today, I'd like to take you back to the book of James. Where his particular style and his particular writing is a little bit in your face, at least compared to the Apostle Paul to some degree. But James is moved by the Holy Spirit and reveals to us what the life of a Christ follower looks like. And we are blessed as it's the Holy Spirit who's called, gathered, and enlightened us and keeps us in the Lord and gives us gifts. We turn around and with all things we always say, 
de volente, Lord willing. That in mind, I invite you to James chapter 4. We'll start at verse 11. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Come now, you, you who say tomorrow or today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it to him, it is a sin. These are the very words of God in an age that I think we can all sadly agree words seem to mean less and less and less to those who speak them. What an amazing comfort that God's word never changes. In fact, these are timeless, powerful truths that are absolutely true and absolutely right in all that they say and that the Holy Spirit works powerfully through these words in the lives of God's people to that end we pray. Sanctify us by your truth, O Lord. Your word is truth. Amen. Sometimes when you're looking at a text and you're talking about what it's saying, it's very helpful to talk about what it's not saying. What is James not saying? James is not saying that you and I or any Christ follower should never, to you know, use a phrase, call out a sin. James is not saying keep your mouth shut when you see sin happening. In fact, Matthew 18, Jesus gives us the steps to take if we have been sinned against or if we see somebody in sin. So that is clearly not what the Bible is saying. That, that somehow, people get this whole idea in their head, this is not biblical, they get this idea in their head that you are somehow unloving if you were to exhort, rebuke, correct, admonish, or basically point out a sin in somebody's life. It's treated as if that's bad, if that's interfering, if that's being holier than thou. The Bible, as you know, speaks very differently about that. It's true love to do those things. Now, in our current culture, you know this, I know this, everybody knows this. One of the worst insults that a person could give towards another person is to say that that is a judgmental person. I mean, your name comes up in a conversation and such and so says, yeah, that person, <laughs> judgmental. And that would be very, very negative, very bad. In fact, Jesus says on the Sermon on the Mount, we already discussed that, right? Judge not lest you be judged. In fact, Jesus even says, how in the world could I judge somebody else? How could I judge the speck in my neighbor's eye when there's a massive, you know, basically what, two by four in my eye? How could I see that? My Superman with x-ray vision, I could see past the two by four? So the Bible speaks that way to us very much. Yet, now, Listen to James, and he is in no way at odds with the words of Jesus. Again, verse 11, do not speak evil against one another, brothers. By the use of the word brothers, he is talking about fellow Christians. The ones who speak against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law but a judge. Now remember, one of the themes of the book of James is be a doer of the word. So this is a massive contrast by him saying, when you become Mr. or Miss Judge, you have moved away from being a doer. Now you're being a judge. It's a move away. Now, here's the thing. James is telling us not to use our own personal standards and bring them 
and put them on someone else as if they must conform to that. Remember what Jesus said here. He said, you will know my followers by their fruit. So James says we're not judges. Jesus says we're not judges, but we are fruit inspectors. The the fruits of faith should be evident in the lives of Christ followers. If they're not, there's a problem. There's just, there is a problem. Scripture is clear on this. When we judge a person then, if I judge someone by my standard, and I have left Scripture, and I've brought in my standard, what's happening here is I'm moving away from the Scriptures, and James says something else. He says, you actually are now judging the law. So it's a double hit now. James is saying, you are putting yourself above the law by judging. Now, that can be a confusing thing to understand, and, and maybe now I will more confuse you. I plan not to more confuse you, but by way of understanding what James is saying, let me offer this as a point of consideration. Okay. The quotes in the bulletin. C.S. Lewis wrote about joy, and he said that in the midst of experiencing joy, if you step back to contemplate joy, you are no longer experiencing joy, but you are contemplating it. Here's the quote. I saw that all my waiting and watching for joy, all my vain hopes to find some mental content on which I could, so to speak, lay my finger and say, this is it, had not or had been a failed attempt to contemplate the enjoyed. In other words, the moment you step out of joy to think about joy, you aren't having joy. You're contemplating the joy. Let's apply that to James. James is saying... You're loving somebody. But in loving them in Christ, as soon as you step away from God's word to pass a judgment on somebody, you are no longer loving them, but you're judging them and you're not following the law. That is James's point. In other words, and this is the easiest thing to do in the world, and God help us all because we have sinful fleshes. It's fun to be the moral police. There was this painting. No, it wasn't a painting. It was a, it was a calendar picture it was one of those spoof calendars that kind of made fun of inspirational calendars, like somebody wiping out. It would say, don't bother trying, you'll fail kind of thing. But the calendar, probably pretty offensive, had an elderly lady sitting on a park bench, and kids were playing, and the caption read, don't mind me, I'm here to observe and judge. I don't know why, but it was kind of funny, but still. James is saying, if we want to find fault with anyone, we can It's so easy. We're sinners. We're not here for that. Now, if the Bible speaks clearly about a situation, let there be no doubt. A sin is a sin. Where the Bible does not clearly speak on a situation, we're actually called to, by God, according to the Eighth Commandment, put the best construction on our neighbor. We're to look at them, and our default mechanism should be this. Prayer to God and try to view the situation in the best possible light. That is what we're called to do. Yet again, if someone is in sin, we are to talk to them. We are to speak about this. 1 Timothy 5.20 As for those who persist in sin, that is such a key phrase, persist in sin. Rebuke them in the presence of all so that they may stand in fear. When someone disobeys God, when somebody is sinning, and you bring them the word of God, that's not your judgment you're bringing. You're bringing God's judgment. You're bringing God's word. You're speaking what God says. When you deliver the unaltered message of God to somebody, that's God talking. That's God talking. Think about it like this. This is so easy. I'll just throw this one at you. If you use Romans 3.23 to talk to someone, for we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, You're not judging the person as being a terrible sinner. You are speaking God's truth. God is giving the judgment. We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We don't want to shy away ever from speaking God's word. And why do we do this again? This is so important. We do this to win the person in sin over in love to Christ. It's done to win someone in love to Christ. Now James moves on to what we could call a summary verse, verse 13. 
Come now, you say, today or tomorrow we'll go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. Bottom line, James is making it. This is the, the summary of four. Always keep in mind, De Valente, Lord willing, all that we do, James is saying, Lord willing. And that's to drive home the point. He's going to drive this point home. He says, he, he tells a story, you know, a fictional story about a merchant, a businessman of sorts, who has a plan. Plans are good. He did the market testing. His product is going well. He got the whole, you know, location, location, location thing together. So he's done all the research and he puts his plan in motion. And now his plan is in motion. He's done everything right except this one little thing. He's totally left God out of the picture. God is nowhere in the factoring of anything. And James is saying this isn't just a mistake. This is sin. Remember again, James is talking about humbling ourselves. Verses 13 through 17 is, is talking about how we, by the grace of God, bring ourselves low when it comes to our knowledge about the future. God alone knows the future. God alone is sovereign. In fact, verse 14 says, you don't know the future. You don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. Think about that. All of our technology, all of our scientific advancements, all the models that we use to try to gauge things and figure things out, we can't even tell anyone what's actually going to happen tomorrow. I mean, you can make a guess. You can extrapolate, but you really can't say for certain at all. Nobody can, except for God. You notice how often Jesus spoke about the future in absolutes and it came true? It always does. In fact, when Jesus said something, when God says something, it will come to pass. That is a biblical truth impressed upon all of us. In fact, one of the clearest marks of the divinity of Jesus is his ability with pinpoint accuracy when he decides or when he wills to tell people about the future, and it happens, always does. So James is, is, is taking in front of us and saying that we have no control over the future, okay? Okay. Maybe James is talking to people because they were caught up in their personal ambitions. Maybe James is talking to successful people that have done very, very well in figuring out maybe latest trends and whatever. And James is saying to them, don't get caught up in your arrogance thinking what you have is going to go so great. You don't know the future. God alone knows the future. Only God alone knows it. Yes, we can say and understandably right, you know, quote unquote business people take calculated risks. We live in a sin-stricken world. You use the brain God gave you. You work with the best information that you have at the time, and then you make a decision, and that is all good, and James is not saying that's bad. James is saying it becomes bad only if you leave God out. If you leave God out. James is not saying, and I want to emphasize this, James is not saying don't make plans. Please. God's a God of order, okay? James is not saying that plans are bad, that plans are wrong. James is not saying making money is bad. Making money is wrong. He is not saying any of that. Rather, James is saying, if we leave God out, that's bad. In fact, our ignorance about the future is an incredible occasion for us to trust God. To know that the weight of our future is all on him. And that's a good place. The Lord in his kindness, let's be honest... The Lord in his kindness keeps our futures hidden from us and thank him for it. Thank him for it. We know we'll be in heaven with the Lord. We know he'll come back again and that's about the extent of it. Right now we live through this sequence of time and we can do so not with fear and not with uncertainty but with joy because we know how this thing ends but we also know who's taking care of us along the way and that is the Lord our God. Listen to how James says this and, and this week especially this is so much more striking. Verse 14, James says, What is your life? For you are a mist that appears, but only a little while, and then vanishes. I mean, this is Ecclesiastes talk, isn't it? Vanity, vanity, we could literally say mist, mist, all is mist. What can we build our life on? But the Bible shares with us, again, in the parable of Luke, how, how short life really is, and how God is in control of it. James is cataloging these things. He's cataloging. This past week, our sister in Christ, Kendra, was called to her heavenly home. 
And to say it was unexpected is probably putting it lightly. It was very unexpected. And yet the Lord in his love and wisdom took her home. Right now, and and when I think about this point, last Sunday was the last sermon she'll hear. Now she gets to hear the Lord, which is a vast improvement for me, I'll give you that. But is this the last sermon I'll ever preach? Is this the last sermon you'll ever hear? We don't know. Only God knows. And that's our comfort. That is our comfort. And so our joy is not found in what we think we can hold on to, but in the Lord that holds on to us. The Lord that through the life, death, and resurrection of his son Jesus Christ brings us eternal life. That is where our comfort truly lasts. You know, it's interesting. Job is a man who who saw the ups and downs of life at the most aggressive levels. Levels I pray nobody that I ever know will have to experience. Jonathan Edwards, the New England preacher from the 1700s, once commented on Job and he said, one of the greatest mistakes Christians make is they read Job as if it's a one-time occurrence. He then said, it's a daily thing. Daily we wrestle against sin. Daily we wrestle against these terrible powers. Daily, like Job, we are preserved by the grace of God. And so James lays in front of us once again this incredible truth. De volente, Lord wills. Total dependence on God. We are totally dependent on God while we sit here. We are totally dependent on God of our very next breath. You just took a breath in by the grace of God. The next breath by the grace of God. The next heartbeat by the grace of God. We are totally dependent upon him. And with joy, we express that in our lives. With joy, we go forward saying, this is great. We're at the mercy of the loving, all-powerful, all-knowing God. And this is a good thing. I am happy for it. I don't know the future. I don't really want to know the future. But I do know God. And God promises he works all things out for the good of his people. And God promises that he is in control and that you are safe with him and that when he wills it, he'll bring you to himself or he may even return before that. In him we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. May the peace of God which passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds centered in the one true faith unto life everlasting. Amen. Let us continue our worship by singing hymn 529, all the verses printed in the bulletin.
to reflect on the sermon meditation taken from the book of James, I'd like to direct your attention to Job. Job speaks here in chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. Job, who, when he went to his wife looking for comfort, she, as you know, instructed him to simply curse God and die. Probably not what he was looking for. He didn't follow that advice. Rather, he turned to the Lord. And it was by God's grace, Job recognized that life is indeed short. But praise God, we are in his hands. Has not man a hard service on earth? And are not his days like the days of a hired hand, like a slave who longs for the shadow, like a hired hand who looks for his wages? So I am allotted months of emptiness and nights of misery are apportioned to me. When I lie down, I say, when shall I rise? But the night is long, and I am full of tossing till the dawn. My flesh is clothed with worms and dirt. My skin hardens and breaks afresh. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and come to their end without hope. Remember that my life is a breath. My eye will never again see good. The eye of him who sees me will behold me no more. While your eyes are on me, I shall be gone. As a cloud fades and vanishes, so he who goes down to Sheol does not come up. He returns no more to his house, nor does his place know him anymore. Our second scripture lesson is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. It's all too easy to store up for ourselves treasures in this life, but ultimately they will bring you nothing of eternal significance. By contrast, being rich in God will last you forever. And here's the good news. God wants you rich in him and makes it happen. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me judge or arbitrary over you? And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetous, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of their possessions. And he told them a parable saying, The land of a rich man produced plentiful. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build big, larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Here ends our scripture lesson. At this point, let us take this opportunity to confess our faith found in the words of the Apostles' Creed on page 5 in your service bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of body the life everlasting. Amen. Let's continue our worship by singing hymn 43. We sing the almighty power of God.
This evening, in addition to our general prayer, we offer a special prayer on behalf of the family of Kendra. As most of you know, the Lord in his love and wisdom, and as far as we're concerned on the side of judgment, has suddenly taken her into his glory, which for her, as we know, is in the much better place being with the Lord. But for her loved ones, uh, remaining behind, and for many of us in the congregation, who become close friends with her over the past couple of years, um, it's going to leave a hole. And we pray that it would be the Lord in his love and wisdom who fill that hole, that gap that has now been created with his presence as only he can do. Also, we offer a special prayer on behalf of Julie, Julie Hannah, my wife. Her mother is undergoing an open heart surgery this Wednesday. Um, no surgery is routine, especially any one of, of a you know, serious nature like this. So we pray it's the Lord's will that the operation will go smooth, that the surgeon will be successful in performing what they need to do in order to correct the problem. With that in mind, let us pray. Father in heaven, we look upon you especially at this time. You tell us, Lord, that our times are in your hands, and Lord, we have complete confidence in that truth. So, Lord, we know that our sister in Christ, Kendra, is with you. As you promised, she has received the crown of life that your son has won for all believers, and she has crossed over from death to eternal life. Lord, we pray it be your will that you'd be with her family, with her friends, that you would offer them the comfort and support that only you, Lord, can give them, that through their tears and their sorrow and their mourning, you will be their God that they can lean on, their strong tower, their strength, and their great reward. Lord, that you assure them that Kendra's sins are wiped clean through the blood of Jesus Christ, just like theirs, just like all believers are, and that they will see their loved ones soon when you call us all into your presence. In the meantime, Lord, we pray that you'd watch over and bless them. Father in heaven, in your hands are the issues of life and death, and we thank you that you alone are God, and you alone love us. We are especially concerned for our sister in Christ, and Lord, you come before us, and you let us know that you too are concerned so concerned that your son Jesus came into the world to take away our greatest problem, our separation from you. So, Father, we pray that you would be with our sister in Christ, Nona, and her upcoming operation. Lord, we pray that it be your will that this operation would be successful, that you would guide and bless the medical team, that they may re repair the problem that has caused the surgery, and that you'll give them great skill and able to bring about that healing. Father in heaven, we pray that you'll be with her loved ones, that they'd find their assurance and comfort in you, and that you would encourage her in this operation and lead her and all your people to always cast their care upon you, for you care for us. And Lord, may their hope and our hope not be put to shame. We leave everything into your good and gracious will. Father in heaven, we pray that you'll open the hearts of many people, that they will see that you are God, and that true love, true mercy, and true life are only found in you, that you will lead all people to repent of their sins and stand before you as the loving God. We pray, Lord, that you would cause us to remember our baptisms into Christ, and that we'd live boldly in all vocations that you have called us into, no matter how difficult in this fallen world, and that we would share you and point to you within our families, our neighborhoods, and throughout the world. Lord, we pray that you would bless our president, our governor, and those that make these decisions, all of those that you use to allow the freedom reign here, that they would live holy, upright, and godly lives so that we can live holy, upright, and godly lives. Father in heaven, the great treasure is the gospel. Let us never prize or treasure anything more than that, but rather, Lord, find our comfort and joy in you. To that end, we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and we know us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for that is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever living hearts the Lord receive the blessing of the true God the Lord bless you and keep you the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Let us conclude our worship this evening by singing hymn 39, printed in the bulletin, all those things.